Welcome to the latest BCS uh, Key Insights webinar. Uh, the theme today is rights and responsibilities in the digital world. Uh, we're going to have a little chat to uh, our guest Andy Fippin shortly. So this is me, Brian Runciman. I'm facilitating the session today. We always encourage people to uh, send uh, questions in if they're able to do it to, while, while we're live, of course. You can do that. So if you've got your um, go to um, webinar software app, there's a little um, orange arrow. If you just press on that, you'll see a, a series of uh, links come down. One of them is called questions. If you just open that up, you can type a question in there direct and uh, either through the webinar or perhaps at the end, uh, we'll try and uh, catch up with some of those. And the webinar will, of course, be uh, available later to view and listen to at your leisure on YouTube as well. Uh, so this is uh, Professor Andy Fippin. Andy, can we just ask you to introduce yourself and then we'll look at some of the things that we're going to try and draw from today's um, webinar. Yeah, hey, afternoon, Brian um, and everyone else. Uh, so yeah, so um, I've got the rather grand title of Professor of Social Responsibility in Information Technology. Um, I kind of had a, a, an interesting journey to get here. My background is entirely computer science. That's PhD level, but sort of towards the end of my PhD, I started to do more around um, ethics in general, um, particularly around the, the sort of merging areas of, of the online world. Um, and then back in about 2005, 2006, I started working with BT on something around sort of trust, online trust. And um, almost by accident, we started talking to children and young people about how technology affects their lives. We sort of like, we talked to a lot of adults and then we ended up talking to, to young people and it became such an interesting sort of discourse I've pretty much done that ever since um, okay. so so there's various parts of my job I obviously lecture at the university on, on issues related to technology and society um, I spend a reasonable amount of time sort of trying to engage and lobby on certain aspects I mean there's there's always a, a, a call for evidence or some government policy change going on that um, that requires comment um, and then I spend, <laughs> I'm spend a reasonable amount of time sitting in small rooms talking to young people about how technology affects their lives and, okay. and that is by far the, the best part of my job um, and this all has a very significant knock-on effect because there doesn't seem to be a day goes by these days without you know what was it today Fortnite's causing depression in, in young people and, and those sorts of things right you know there's always something going on particularly the press um, with their own agendas around and criticising the, the tech sector and the online world, but yes. also government ministers trying to build careers off the, the back of the, I'm the minister who saved children from the internet and those sorts of things as well. So Quite. I, I kind of like, <laughs> like my job is as a, I feel like a critical friend. Yes, um, okay. Just to reflect on these sorts of things. Now, now, 10 years ago, I'd have been way more critical of the, the tech sector than I am now. I, I see like great strides forward in terms of responsibility in the mm. tech sector to the point now where it's, becoming like oh, please can we stop saying that tech sector has to do stuff about this there are other stakeholders in yeah. child safeguarding that really need to step up to the plate as well yeah. and i think that's, that's some of the things we're going to sort of reflect on in in this webinar lovely well um, i appreciate you spending some time in a small room with an older person uh, today <laughs> as you uh, talk about uh, some of these things uh, with us so uh, let's uh, have a look at our what will you learn slide so this these are the bits that you you've sort of picked out current mm -hmm. policy positions, reflections on the role of ethics and responsibilities in the sector, well, you've already just sort of yeah. uh, come yeah. towards that. And um, the difference between legislative and ethical responsibilities, and that is quite important if we're saying that uh, the responsibilities are actually more widely spread than just um, one particular um, profit-led segment. Absolutely. I mean, I think it's one of the things that, I mean, I have been accused recently of being very um, anti-conservative on this sort of thing. I, I should say that probably for the last 10 years, we've had what I'd refer to as legislative hyperactivity in this area. Right. It's like, oh, children are being cyberbullied. Let's make cyberbullying illegal. It's like, well, we've already got legislation about hate crimes and threats to yeah. violence and, and threats, um, sexual threats and those sorts of things as well. It's like, oh, oh what, what is it now? Well, look, terrorists are using encryption. We better stop people using encryption. There's, there's never any reflection and it's not particularly a party political issue i think there is a short termism in in politics yeah. where people would need to make their mark before they move on so legislation which is sometimes incredibly poorly thought out if we look at the the first iteration of the digital economy act which was going to stop file sharing mm. by cutting off people's internet connections if they've done too much file sharing you look at the human rights issues around <laughs> that and the fact that the un has described um Internet access is now as a fundamental human right. Talking about a piece of legislation 
in supposedly a developed country that is directly contradicting citizens' um, individual rights. And yeah. no one seems to have time to reflect on those sorts of things. So yeah, yeah, obviously you have the legislation, but also we do have, you know, a right to reflect on things. You know, I've lectured um, computer science students for a long time. One of the tests I, I normally um, say to them is hands up if you get on a plane you've written software for. And you very, very rarely <laughs> get a student putting their hands up. And mm. you sort of go, hmm, a bit of worry. A worry <laughs> um, but then you realise that, you know, there's an awful lot of computer science curriculum that doesn't really address testing and, and maintenance as part of the software yeah. process very well at all. It's all about the code and, oh, we can do something cool. I think that's one thing the sector has been guilty of is because technologically it's possible, let's do it. Let's do it, yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, you look at something like tracking kids, which, you know, there's, there's an awful lot of um, technology out there, so you can sell a, a wristband to a parent so they can track their child the whole time. Mm. Yet, if you look at the um, sentencing guidance around domestic abuse amongst adults, they specifically say that tracking technology is corroborating evidence around domestic abuse. So on the one hand, they're saying, we'll track kids to keep them safe. But on the other hand, they're saying, if you do this to an adult, it's domestic abuse. We don't really think about yeah. what is it we're introducing into society sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is a cool thing, so let's do it. Yeah, absolutely. We'll think about the consequences yeah, yeah. afterwards. Look look at that map. I can see where they're going. <laughs> yeah. Very exciting. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, the child leaves their, their phone somewhere or they switch their device off and we go, my God, their pushpins disappeared. I'm going to mobilise the National Guard. There's going to be a danger or something. <laughs> yeah. You know, is this something that reassures us or is it something that makes us more anxious? So uh, let's move on to this uh, picture here <laughs> <laughs> then of uh, uh, Mr. Hancock. Um very much targeting organizations yeah social media organizations uh, what's your take on that approach um i mean mr hancock's been in the press an awful lot recently I mean, he rather famously said his children aren't old enough to use the internet yet he needs to sort it out before they are which is a, a, right. a worrying comment to when you're proposing legislation that affects millions of people um but, but sort of moving on from that. Also, if his children are older than two, they probably are using Well, yeah, he said they're like three or four. It's like, well, I'm sure they are already. Yes. But, but um, um, I, it, it just seems to be that there seems to be a, 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 almost like a train at the moment. It's like, oh, well, we've got the AV, the AV stuff around age verification, which we're going to talk about in a little while. Mm. Um, it's like, what, what more can the sector do? The sector needs to do more. The sector needs to do more. And there's almost like this mantra coming from government now, do more, do more, do more. Yeah. And again, it's something we're reflecting. When you, you sort of think of some of the things they're talking about now, and you just think, have you really thought that through? So, I mean, this, this particular um, news article was taken from the fact that Mr. Hancock said that social media companies need to manage screen time for children. Mm. You think, well, how? Because, you know, we, we are transfixed on this 13-year-old thing, which is basically based on American advertising legislation, although it seems to have become the de facto thing, children can't yeah. be safe online until they're 13. It's nonsense, it's about um, parental consent and advertising. Yes. Um, but how can a child identify themselves as 13? Um, it's, unless we're saying we need to access their birth certificate or something like that. <laughs> um, so first of all, the social media company how are they going to 100% prove that everyone on is, is the right age anyway? But secondly, we're talking about young people working on multiple platforms. So if you say, if you we're going to pass some legislation to this, social media companies need to make sure that children are online for less than two hours a day. How do we know that? Because if they're on Instagram for a bit, then they're on Snapchat for a bit, mm. then on Musical.ly for a bit. Are we saying these companies have to share sensitive information about children because? Surely that contributes to GDPR, which would be a worry if that was yeah. the case. Um, so and are, are all platforms the same? Absolutely. Mm. You know, that's, that's one of the things. It is the classic question I get asked by parents, how long should my child be online for? And I yeah. say, well, how long do you think your child should be online for? Yeah. And they, they sort of look crestfallen as if there should be a magic figure. Now, someone interacting with their mates to build a Minecraft add-on to plug into the, their world and, and look at how cool it is, is a way richer collaborative experience yeah. than just sat staring at the screen looking at YouTube. Yeah. But in my day, it's kind of like, oh, you're watching too much TV. TV's addling your brain. Those sorts of things now. The internet is the, is the thing that's done that. Mm. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Yeah. So um, here's a little, um, this was a meme, wasn't it, actually, I think. Yeah, yeah. If it's just... unacceptable offline, then it's unacceptable online. Quite a good principle, I would have thought. It's a good principle, but it's an utterly unimplementable. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yes it's... Well, a good principle for a parent, perhaps, so, to, to use with their well, children. I, I think one, one of the things, you know, you can talk to children, you can reflect on, you know, who do you want to see this? Because 
they very rarely think about their privacy and those sorts of things. There are interesting principles to talk about there. But mm. take the word unacceptable on Hugh's view. Is it yeah. unacceptable? Is it the parents' view? Is it the government's view? Is it the child's view? You know, I, I visit schools a great deal. I was in a school last week talking to 300 um, year nines and ten, so they're between 13 and 15. And the government is very, very, very concerned about children of that age accessing pornography. I say to this group of 300 children, hands up, who's concerned about people your age looking at pornography? About 10 people put their hands up. Mm. You know, it might be unacceptable to us, and yeah, I don't want kids looking at porn. But equally, the idea that we're going to stop them with some technological countermeasure is, is bizarre. But yeah. but who decides what is unacceptable? It's such a, an intangible cloud of a term. Well, I remember when uh, the App Store was is in its infancy, and Apple banned uh, one or two apps almost straight out the straight out the gates, didn't they? And obviously, that uh, caused a lot of free speech yeah, discussion. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. on what basis were they making their decision? I feel really sorry for some of the big tech companies sometimes because they go, you need to make decisions on that. And obviously, if they're being threatened with legislation, they will go err on the side of caution. So they will probably take stuff down that, that people might go, well, hang on a minute, how dare you? You're a private sector company. How can you possibly judge the morality of a nation? Mm. Those sorts of things. So, so who defines unacceptable? If we're, if we're looking, and we have to if we're looking at things like algorithm, if we're looking at literal interpretation, because mm. you can't say to an algorithm, yeah, 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 just make up your mind. You know, it has to. It has to be rule based, and it has to be correct. Yeah. Who defines what that unacceptability yeah. is? And if we can't do that, where do we start with this? It's unacceptable online. What does that mean? I'm, I'm sure that you know a, a 13 year old kid playing Fortnite for, for six hours today would not go. That's an unacceptable level of screen time. However, someone else might go. That's an unacceptable mm. level of screen time. We forget there's so many different stakeholders in this area. Because everyone is yep. an expert in this area. You know, it's the classic, I've got a mobile phone, I'm on Facebook, I've got children. I know what's best for everybody. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Mm. So this is, these are some of the suggestions. Uh, so we, 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 we've already addressed some of these, haven't we? Or started to look at the major verification for everyone. I mean, that's fine if you want to start collecting even more information I mean, about we, everybody. We, we struggle. We're really struggling with the whole um, age verification on pornography thing anyway. How can people in this country prove they are 18? Yeah. Because, you know, is it with the driving license that everyone's got a driving license? Is it with a passport and everyone's got a passport? National insurance number. Well, it specifically says when you receive your national insurance card, this cannot be used for age verification. Yeah. So you're getting some great proposals now, such as MindGeek are going to look after age verification. So, People don't know MindGeek run Pornhub, which is a, a, <laughs> a, a poacher term game yes, yes, that's, scenario. That's, yeah, exactly. Um, and also a proposal that we pop down the local post office to purchase a porn pass. So we, we purchase a card with a 16-digit alphanumeric code on it, and we mm. type that in the first time we wish to access our, our adult entertainment sites, and then it remembers us and it moves forward from there. Mm. So then you've got the case of adults going into news agents to purchase token-based identification to access content they are legally allowed to access in the first place. Yes. Um, and also, what the hell would the resale value of those porn passes be outside of secondary school? Well, well, quite, yeah. <laughs> That's like sending your older mate in to buy some alcohol and just bring it out to you, isn't it? Absolutely. You know, like, you've got these things through, lad. Yeah. Um, so these are, these are questions we're asking the providers to, to do without actually reflecting on you know, everyone sort of says to me, well, what do you want to do about pornography? I want to develop an education curriculum where young people understand it from a critical perspective. Mm. So if they're looking at something um, at an early age and maybe being desensitized by it, they have the critical faculties to realize this isn't normal. This isn't what normally happens with yeah. when people have sex and things. Rather than going, right, we're going to stop them looking at it. And then on your 18th birthday, you knock yourselves out. You can have as much as you want. <laughs> you <know? laughs> what is it ever suddenly about the 18th birthday that makes someone resilient yeah. to, to the potential harms? Yes. OK. So um, that's the bit we've... Um... But those are the bits we've covered yeah, there, really, yeah. aren't we? Those sections. Mm -hmm. So let, let's have a look at. Um, I, I thought it was a good point you made earlier that tech, tech companies actually shouldn't be not quite as much as perhaps in previous times, in that they are making a lot of efforts yeah, now in the right yeah, direction, yeah, yeah. and it is more than just a binary yeah. yes or no situation. So these are some of your um, views on what com companies do well. Yeah, no, I, I think certainly in terms of reporting, it's come on a great deal in the last few years. Um, not just the fact that you can report people and block people on sites, but there's also you 
you have a visible response because one of the things I talk about with young people is, you know, how do you know reporting is useful? It's like, well, they've always got a story that they report to someone and nothing happened. So if you can, if someone reports something and there is a clear, open, transparent response that they see someone mm. listing, they see that it's happening, you know. Gaming platforms are very good at this sort of thing now with, with banning people for being abusive and yes. those sorts of things. And, you know, I have many conversations with gamers going, oh, that's all right, if someone's abusive, you just report them and they get kicked off. Yeah. So... You know, those things are a great strides forward. You know, algorithms are good for certain things. Now, we could probably spend a whole different session talking about filtering and mm. the problems with filtering, but, but the fact is you can put filtering on things. Filtering can be very useful at stopping very young children accidentally stumbling across content you don't want them to see and things as well. All of the ISP, all the major ISPs in the country provide filters that we can install in the home. I can't remember the latest stats, around 5 or 6% of us have chosen to do that, which would suggest the yes. efficacy of filters. <laughs> um, but equally, there are tools there. Technology companies are providing technology to help, but it's not the solution. So what research have we done or has been done on how much responsibly, responsibility parents think they should take? So, for example, if only 5 or 6% have put filters on internet search engines, for mm -hmm. example, is it because they don't know about the filters? Or they just don't care, and they're not taking I think one of the their problems, parental responsibilities seriously enough. One of the problems is that generally filters will overblock. Um, right. So famously, as my son told me the other day, you can't type in Scunthorpe at school. No. Because okay. Because a very bad. There's word a word in the middle of it. Yes. Absolutely. Scunthorpe. Um, uh, and it would also block things like things around gender, sexuality, sexual health, all those sorts of things as well. So those might be reasons that if oh no, the filter stopped it again, I'll just it. Too much hassle. Yeah. However, let's face the fact, parents look at porn as well. So, mm. so maybe they can't be bothered to set up multiple profiles at home and all sorts of things. But, but equally, do they have the knowledge to do that? Um, you know, it's a sort of running joke in the online safety community. When you do a parent session, you either get 100 parents turning up or two. <laughs> you know, so yeah. there, there never seems to, you know, a lot of parents will go, well, isn't the school doing all that and those sorts of things as well? But, mm. but equally, where's the national coordination around public education in this area? Yeah. It's fed through the popular media. Most of the popular media is basically going, tech companies are bad. They're making your kids addicted to gaming. They're making your kids addicted to social media. They're making your children depressed. Whereas, is that the case or is mm. it a broader environment? It's very easy to point the finger at a social media platform and go, that's what's causing it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, here's an interesting quote. <laughs> <laughs> Dear Jeremy Hunt, yeah, one of my favourite politicians for... Um, comments about technology. Yes. Um, so, so this was from um, a health select committee inquiry at the end of 2016, and it's very easy for politicians to just come out and say things. Um, and it was a an inquiry into children's mental health, and they were talking about the the impact of mobile technology. And someone had mentioned the fact that you know, sexting, the exchange of indecent images, is something that has can have a negative impact on on teens and sometimes younger. So Jeremy comes out with this very clear statement here. You know, it's it's very simple. We just stick an algorithm on a mobile phone that detects whether an indecent image has been taken by the young person and then stop it from being sent. The technology exists to do that. Mm. And when the Secretary of State for Health and, and, and now Social Care as well says those sorts of things, then people pick up on it and report on it, and it becomes almost... True. True, because, <laughs> oh, someone said that an algorithm could do it, but, you know... So, if you sort of reflect on what he's actually talking about doing, there's a whole number of different like, problems with it. So, so you know, you, you sort of reflect on this top-level comment there. Mm. What do we mean by sending an image, first of all? Are we talking about exchanging it on a messaging platform? Or are we talking about Bluetooth dropping it, are we emailing it, <laughs> are we SMSing it? Are we, mm. You know, there's so many different ways we can do that. How do we know the user of the phone is under 18? If it's set up with a parental contract, yeah, my, my two children have both got phones, they're both registered as under 18 because I pay their phone bill because what I don't want from my kids is they're in the middle of nowhere and I'm trying to phone out the girl, oh, sorry, couldn't get in touch with you, I was out of credit. So, you know, I know my kids are on there, but you know, there's so many hand-me-down phones now, there's pay-as-you-go phones, there's people picking up phones from their mates and things. So how do we know that's a young person using that phone? Yeah. When you're looking at the concept of indecency. That's a really interesting one. We have very clear legal definitions of obscenity, which I won't go into on a webinar, but, but we, do have, good. <laughs> we do have some very clear legal definitions there. We don't have clear legal definitions for indecency. 
because one person's indecency is another person's titillation. Yeah. yeah, and that's going to change hugely from country to country. Absolutely, that's culture, absolutely. There's you know there's, there's massive issues culturally there. And so so who decides on the threshold for indecency? Going mm. back to who decides on what's unacceptable? And then you've got a point is you know algorithm image recognition algorithms generally are neural network based. They're normally trained being fed other images. So if we're saying we want an algorithm that identifies indecent images of children, don't we have to train that by feeding it indecent images of children? Now the moral standpoint That's how AI works, is, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. is just yeah. jaw-droppingly concerning yes. if that is the case. Or are we talking about you know the, the famous ones about uh, flesh tone recognition and all those sorts yeah. of things? And um, but in that case, you end up blocking an awful lot of stuff that, that maybe isn't. Or are we talking about indecency? Where, where do we stop? Is it a naked picture? Is it someone in underwear? Is it top half someone? Is it bottom half someone? Who defines this? There was a very famous case in the US many, many years ago about pornography where the, where the judge went. Um, I wouldn't be able to define it legally, but I know it when I see it. Well, that's <laughs> helpful. That, that's the difference mm. between an algorithm that needs rules and laws yes. and a human which can make an interpretation. Yeah, and a judgment call. Um, yeah. But I think the other, you know, the major point here is what Jeremy Hunt was actually calling for there is a private sector organization to make moral judgments on the behavior of a child based on an entirely technological inf intervention that can't possibly be accurate mm. in its interpretation. Without being uh, simplistic about it, it, it seems to me that all these uh, discussions come back to uh, the, the the culture that a, that a family has, that, that, that a parent or a set of parents uh, engaging with their children, it still seems to come back to parental responsibility to Absolutely. me, much more so than, yeah, yeah, yeah. you can't really expect it, a capitalistic organisation who, who, at the end of the day, do need to survive in, in the real world and produce advertising yeah. and so forth, uh, to make moral decisions that everyone will agree with anyway. Yeah. So it's still a parent thing, isn't it? If you have one provider that becomes very conservative with the safeguarding they install onto a child's phone, you know, they just move on to another platform. Yeah. You know, because I'm like, this is really restrictive. And also the parent gets fed up with the fact they're getting alerts sent to their phone every now and then going, your child might be sending an indecent image, your child might be sending an indecent image. You know, so yeah, absolutely. And, you know, if you've got a situation where there is trust in the family environment, and yeah, one of the things that young people tell me, you know, when I say what can adults do to help in these sorts of areas, they say, listen, be knowledgeable and don't judge. The yeah. worst thing a child wants is for their device to be taken off them because someone's been reading something in the paper. They've decided their child might be engaging in that as well. They don't understand the issues. They're not listening to what the child's saying. They're just deciding they know best. So you get you end up with an erosion of trust and then you end up with the child having a pay as you go phone given to them by their mates, which they're doing all the dodgy stuff on anyway. Yeah. So, you know, it comes down to something entirely tech neutral, which is conversations and trust and support and those sorts of things as well. So one thing I've actually heard parents say is I don't really, I mean, this is common going right back to video recorders, isn't it? I can't work the video recorder yeah. down to now. I don't understand all this stuff and I can't learn it now. But that's not really good enough, is it? I don't think that's good enough. <laughs> I think that's an absolute responsibility because, yeah, yeah, absolutely, you know, I, I, I talk to see young people these days, it's all musically and Instagram and Snapchat and all those sorts of yeah. things. But in five years' time, it'll be something else. Five yes. years ago, I was talking to them all about Facebook. Apparently, Facebook's really, really rubbish now because all the old people. That's passe, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Once the yeah. old people go somewhere, then the kids don't want to be there anymore. But these things are all about communication. These things are all about interaction. These things, when it boils down to it, the reason that someone might exchange an indecent image with somebody else, whether they are a minor or an adult, is because they want them to like them, or there's an issue of respect or an issue of consent there. All of those sorts of things are the things we can talk about as children from a very early age. Yeah. If someone is wants you to do something and it's making you uncomfortable, it is all right to say, no, bugger off, yeah. you know, frankly. Yeah. Um, we don't have to start off with, let's talk about sex and let's talk about technology. You know, when I go into a primary school and they go, we don't talk to them about social media because they shouldn't be on it until they're 13. And I go, yeah. why? <laughs> and they go, because it's illegal. I go, no, it's not. And they go, you know, it's a very easy excuse to not engage with it, I think. Yeah. And I think, some, well, I don't really understand all, the, all that technology stuff. I find that a weird, uh, a weird stance. Now, we've had a question come in from... Uh... From a from a mum, I happen oh, to know, who, who's a member. Um, is there a trusted source that parents can go to for advice? And they they're citing Mumsnet, the NSPCC, that that sort yeah, of yeah. thing. I mean, Internet Matters is established by the four main ISPs. Internet provide, Matters, yeah. Internet Matters. They provide um, 
advice and support for parents. Um, the Safer Internet Centre, UK Safer Internet Centre, has a big parents area in it as well. The NSPCC put up some very good stuff as well. So there are a number of different sources you can go to to sort of get help and support. Mm. But also put pressure on your children's school. Go in there. Say, what are you what are you doing around online behaviours? I don't like the term online safety. I don't think we can make children safe. We can make them resilient though, which is much, much rather they were. Um, but what are they doing yeah. about online issues and online behaviours and things? And you know, schools have an expectation that they deliver education in that area. So go in and ask them what's happening as well. I find the concept of online safety interesting. I, I know that you've got a slide in a minute, a picture of a, of a playground, because yeah. it's, it's a kind of a, an analogy we can use, isn't it? Um, kids can still throw themselves off the top of a of a, of a merry-go-round or whatever, yeah. couldn't they? So you can make the playground as safe as is yeah, yeah, yeah. possible. Yeah, if, and if we make people safe because they can't see the content or they can't interact with the game or, or something like that, then what happens when they do? What I'd rather is they were developing yeah. critical... Um, knowledge and they were developing resilience so when bad things happen probably through no fault their own someone sends them a you know I'm, I'm sure my daughter in time will, will have a text message of someone from school going and send me a nude I want her to be confident to be able to go you know, sod off Clear and, off, absolutely. and yeah. to be able to tell me and then obviously we'll go around and see the lad and, and give him a damn good talk no, we do that. <laughs> but obviously my first response to the father is I want to protect her yeah, but I yeah. know if I do that she's going to go oh God, she's overreacted I'm not going to tell him again yes so you need so to dug around and beat up their dad. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Dug around and dangle children out of like top floor windows and things. In Paris, absolutely. <laughs> um, we had a question from da Dave, uh, Danvin Davies. Um, should digital responsibility and awareness be taught as a core subject in secondary schools? That's, it, I'm sure that's I part think of it, it should start in primary before schools. Before that, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, we can start. One of the things I find when I go into a primary school, and I mentioned something like musically, is they all start whispering like, oh, it's an adult that knows about musically. You know, <laughs> I'm like, hang on a minute. Um, and, you know, we can talk to them about this sort of thing from earlier. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we can talk about, you know, critical content, reflecting what we see online. It doesn't have to, you know, one of the one of the standard daily mail responses to any of this is, oh, you want to teach kids about porn? That's disgraceful. Mm. It doesn't have to be about the sexual stuff, but it can be about consent and boundaries and respect and all those sorts of things. And, you know, the NSPCC do some brilliant resources around um, pants and privacy, the Pantosaurus and stuff, which okay. is a great way of having a very early discourse around what privacy is. Yes. Um, yeah. from a very early age now let's let's move on uh, that's <laughs> that's a sort of personal level isn't it and, yeah. and that's important but um you wanted to talk a little bit more about the sort of uh, whistle the four horsemen of the infopocalypse <laughs> yes uh, yeah. which is a lovely concept that was developed by a, a an american tech guy back in the 90s um i mean this is a, a standard policy response that that many governments have taken that um if you try and win the public over by going ah oh, well we don't like social media so you shouldn't use it most people will go yeah, but I love it. You know, let's take something like WhatsApp. Yeah, but I love it, but it's encrypted. But if you take one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, which are you know terrorism, paedophiles, drug dealers, or organised crime, and go, mm. yeah, but they use it, mm. um, then all of a sudden you start to win over public opinion, and a lot of this is about winning over public opinion to drive through legislation. So, for example, with something like WhatsApp, I mean, a couple of years ago after we had the um, the, the terrorist attacks in in London, like, well. They were communicating on WhatsApp. WhatsApp's encrypted. We can't see their messages. If we allow you to have encryption, the terrorists have won. Yes. Do you want the terrorists to win? And all of a sudden, it's, yeah. it's no longer sort of rational and pragmatic. It's like, oh, we don't like this, therefore. You know, so so if you look at um, some of David Cameron's speeches on, on pornography and why we want to filter pornography, it's like, well, you know, if people who consume pornography end up consuming child abuse images, you end up uh, abusing children. Mm. Yes, there have been... Uh, cases where you can trace that back, but there's no, there's no evidence whatsoever to say there's a causation there. No. You know, correlation and causation, two very, very different things. Um, so, well, but if you say, oh, do you do you want to support paedophiles? No one wants to support paedophiles. You, you go, oh, actually, well, yeah, yeah. I think I think you've got yeah. a good point here. Yeah. It's a very, it's a far easier thing to win people over on extreme perspectives where you can take an extreme position and go, they use this technology, they're bad. You're going to let the bad guys win, are you? And oversimplification, isn't it? I mean, I use a, a an app called Boggle, which mm. is just um, well, it's not Boggle, is it? It's based on Boggle. I can't remember what it's called now. Mm. Uh, but you can communicate pe with people that you play with. Yeah. So 
terrorists could use that. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, if, I'm not making that suggestion, by the way. <laughs> I'm just a, saying that this it's, is, it's not just a matter of closing down a platform, I'm is it? I'm sure there's been some terrorist attacks that have been planned in cafes. Are we expecting cafe owners to monitor exactly. the conversations and every exactly. single conversation that goes on there? And, you know, they are culpable in some way. When there was the bomb in London and there was the Lidl's in, um, was it Parsons Green, the, the tube attack? Yes, yeah. It was in a Lidl's carrier bag. No one's going, well, Lidl's, you know, they've allowed him to carry that bag. You know, it's, it's kind of, it, it's ridiculous if you take that perspective. Yes. So why? Because they used a particular p- communications technology to go, well, yeah. are we? Well, in the past, they used the phone, wouldn't they? Yeah, yeah. They used the phone yeah. or, you know, yeah. they, they met face to face, you know, and that, things like that. Exactly. So, so yeah, the, the you know, the, the, the standard process here is, you know, if, if you wish to have greater control of it, and, and you can see why governments might not like citizens to have, for example, encryption, because you can't monitor what they're doing the whole time then, and maybe that they yeah. might be easier to govern if you could monitor what they were doing. So, you, But if you then go, oh, we need to control encryption, we go, hang on a minute. Yes. But, uh, but I've got a right to privacy, then you go, but the terrorists are using it. So you go down this process and... You, Wasn't it Jeremy Clarkson that gave out his uh, banking information? Yeah, yeah, then someone set up a direct debit. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because he was sort of going, oh, it's nonsense, there's no yeah. such thing as identity theft. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's quite funny. Yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but this sort of simplistic reasoning um, it goes back to what you were talking about earlier, which is short-term thinking, yeah, which short-term tends to be thinking. political. It's, it's to get to Friday afternoon, yeah, isn't yeah. it, rather than two years. If you go to a politician's Wikipedia page, they've got, oh, oh this is, these are the campaigns they were successful in, yeah. and all those sorts of things. Yeah. yeah. So um, yeah, this uh, is an interesting principle, I think. This is, just, you know, um, Raynham, who's a, quite a famous IT security guy, was very famously quoted in the forum. Uh, many years ago now, mm. it's a very simple statement, and you can't help but agree with it, can you? You nope. don't solve social problems with software. Absolutely. Software can help, software can be a tool, but you do not solve social problems. If you look at social media, it's a mirror to the world. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You know, you can't stop people thinking bad things because um, they're using social media. You can't ban them. You could say that social media in some way can facilitate bad thoughts or, or legitimise people's views. But equally, you can get a bunch of people after a few pints down the pub coming out with some pretty abhorrent things as well. Yeah, absolutely. And again, we're yeah. not saying it's down to the public and to to make sure that doesn't happen. Perhaps we could take the the other view that um, the fact that uh, certain platforms have opened up people to be a bit more honest about what they think might uh, give some more accurate reflection of the problems we need to address as well, a society. Well, absolutely. And you've got an evidence trail. You know, when you had bullying and a playground bullying, it was just one child's word against another child. Yeah. You've got someone who's abusing someone online, the advice we give is right screen grab everything. Absolutely. Yeah. You know? Um but yeah, just just to sort of like move towards the end of the field, I'm, I'm not saying that um industry are whiter than white. I mean this is taken from a yes from a website by a, a, an app provider that, that's claiming they've got the solution to sexting. So they're going to parents going, Oh, you're worried that your ch- your child might be sexting. Buy our product, it will stop them doing it. And I think that's really quite irresponsible language. Yeah. First of all, we know there aren't any solutions that are 100% safe and 100% robust. Um, this particular app as well says, oh, don't worry, we, we respect your child's privacy. We don't share the image. We send you an alert. So what happens when you've got uh, a false positive there? You know, If you yeah. reflect on the, the Notting Hill Carnival police facial recognition system where they were accurate 5% of the time, <laughs> two, two white women were arrested for being to black male criminals, <laughs> you know, or they weren't arrested, but they were identified by the system doing that. You kind of think, well, what's going to happen in the family home then? The parent's mm. phone's going to go beep, beep, your child sending a nude. They go crashing through the, the child's bedroom door. They have a row. They demand to see the phone. There's nothing on the phone that's yeah. dodgy. Yeah. The, the trust's completely gone. There's a picture of, a, of an orange VW. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. 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 Or someone's feet or something. Yeah. You know, oh, there's a lot of flesh tone in that one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, it, it, I don't know wh- which part of the um, uh, blurb you took this from, but when the third sentence says children can be placed on the sex offenders register, yeah, it's a little bit of a uh, a, a panic. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. No, I, I mean I, that's one of the messages I would love to see completely removed from any education in this area as well, because yes, what they're doing is illegal, but it's based upon a ne- 1978 law that never ever reflected on the fact that the taker of the image might be the person in the image as well. Yes. And most police forces are now saying it's very rarely in the public interest to criminalise a child for self-generating an indecent image of themselves. Mm. Mm. But you end up with these horrible situations where children are victimised and criminalised for, you know, 
Back in my day, it was Polaroid cameras or something. Yes, quite. <laughs> um, mm. So, you know, it's, it's, the behaviours are similar. So that's what I was referring to earlier. Um... No, I, I kind of <laughs> like to use the playground analogy because, you know, we, we as parents don't drop our kids off at the playground and go, right, now it's entirely the responsibility of the playground provider. If there's yeah. any problem or harm or anything there, I'm going down the pub, I'll be back in two hours. We have yeah. an expectation that the playground provider makes sure all the equipment is safe and, and in good working order. And, you know, there's no sharpness on it. They have a responsibility. But we as parents also have a responsibility to, so that we don't leave our child there who goes around belting another kid on the swings because they want to get on the swings or the seesaw or something like that. Yeah. We have a responsibility to, to look after our children as well. Yeah, I'd like to sue the council if your child pulls up a seesaw, aren't you? Unless the seesaw's got a spike stuck yeah, out of the seat. Yeah, absolutely. You know, well, I know there was a case in Plymouth of using lead paint in the playground, which was a bit of a worry. <laughs> but yeah, you know, there, there has been. Um, but that's a legitimate concern, since, I would yeah, say. Yeah, there's been investigations since then. The idea that. I oh, know your child thump my child that's the playground provider's responsibility yeah goes back to this whole discussion around platform versus publisher yes you know when you've got someone like Reese Mogg saying that all providers should be viewed as publishers you could pretty much kill any interaction on the internet with that one because yeah. if you imagine the BCS which provides forums and things you're responsible for everything anybody says in that the first thing you do in terms of policy right we'll pull that then yes There's no way we're going to be held Absolutely. responsible for someone saying something litigious so. exactly that so yeah so this is our, this is our summary, Andy. It's been very interesting t talking to you. And there's there's all sorts of avenues we could have pursued for oh, much, much, for much yeah, longer, yeah, of course. Quite a short chat. Yeah, yeah, but uh, but you know we got a good overview there. Thank you very much for the work you put into that. We certainly enjoyed it, and I'd like to thank the listeners uh, for listening in as well.